some good sleep. Good morning. good morning. Thank you for joining us in worship in the Hanson Chapel once again. We're blessed to be together. Amen. I have just a few announcements, and if anyone else has, holler away. Many in our congregation have long, long-standing issues. We ask you to continue to pray for them. I'm asking for special prayers this morning for Lisa Davis, who fell out of her wheelchair and broke two vertebrae and her nose. And she's ready for an operation and needs our prayers daily. She did have it. Thank you, Rob. That's encouraging. Poor Lisa's been through so much. This evening, the service is at 6 o'clock at the Lutheran Church. Please keep all of the Hansons in your prayers, as this is the one-year anniversary of losing Rick. If you're able, I invite you to stand, and we will have the invocation in Lord's Prayer. Dear God, as we begin this church service, we seek your guidance and wisdom. We acknowledge that we are imperfect and in need of your divine direction. Open our hearts and minds to your word, that we may receive the insights and revelations you have for us today. May your spirit be our compass, leading us in the paths of righteousness. Help us to discern your will and follow it faithfully. We trust in your unwavering guidance and ask for your presence to be palpable among us. In your name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please take your song sheet for the opening medley.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I, I'm glad to see the barn filling up, and uh, I'm glad to hear you'll be looking forward to a new uh, church worship space in the fall. And uh, again, for the generosity of the Hansons and letting this be the chapel area for the summer. Um, the scripture reading today is from the 8th chapter of Luke, verses 26 to 38. 8th chapter of Luke, the verses 26 to 38. And sermon title this morning is, When the Holy Isn't Comfortable. When people aren't comfortable in the holiness of God. Now to give you the context before I read the passage, Jesus and the disciples have gone across the sea to Galilee to the area known as the Gerasenes. And Gerasenes is part of the Roman province of Decapolis, which means the ten cities. I'm not sure by this time there were 10 cities in the province. But it was an area that was colonized by the veterans, the soldiers of Alexander's, the Greeks, empire. So it was a Gentile area. And that explains why there is a herd of pigs. Because across the Sea of Galilee, in the province of Galilee, it's a Jewish province. You wouldn't found, have found a herd of pigs in Galilee. But as you go across the sea, you enter a Gentile area, and the Gerasene area is just on the edge of the province of Decapolis. And it is an area that Jesus traveled through and preached in and did miracles in. As controversial as that would have been to the Pharisees of his day, Jesus went into the Gentile area and proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and healed people and delivered people. The same as he did in Samaria. So what you have here is the context of, the, of where Jesus is going and what he finds when he arrives. So Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 38. It was a good thing Jesus surrounded by fishermen because he was going back and forth to the Sea of Galilee all the time. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. And for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him and Though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd 
rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. There's probably ten sermons in this passage. It's just powerful. It reminds us and teaches us again about the spiritual reality that we live in. That we war not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and the powers of darkness and evil in the highest realms of dimensions we do not comprehend. And God in his sovereignty draws us and brings us in to join him in the battle. Well, I don't want to give a sermon that before the sermon. <laughs> May we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we uh, want to come into your presence this morning, and, and we thank you we can come into this place and worship you. So to be together with each other and to be with you together, we ask that you take from us all our distractions and all our worries and all our preoccupations and all our fears that we would just live in the light of your holiness and your power and your presence. Help us to see you as Moses saw the burning bush aflamed but not consumed, powerful, holy, yet burning with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and sanctification. Help us in our human thinking, in our in the limits, not to diminish who you are in our thoughts. But open our minds wide and our souls wide open that in our feebleness we would attempt to grasp and see your holiness, your power, and your merciful presence. We look out in a world, Lord, where there is so much evil and brokenness. We pray your Holy Spirit would come upon this world in a fresh and powerful way. We pray especially for North America and Western Europe that as you have done in the past there would be a great new awakening, a great new revival, a powerful outpouring of your Holy Spirit 
that in whole communities and states and regions that the powers of evil would be driven back and subdued once again. And that we would foretaste your kingdom which is present and is to come. And help us to live into the reign of your rule and your sovereignty and the freedom that only you bring. So this morning, our God, we ask again, forgive all our sins. Heal all our diseases. Deliver us from all that afflicts and oppresses us. And please provide and bless us in the smallest details of our lives. And please mold us and make us as the potter molds the clay. Into living lives that glorify and please you. Bless the time of our worship together. May every thought and word, even the very movement of our hands, be pleasing in your sight. In your precious, eternal name we pray again. Amen. you to stand. Our next hymn is 214, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness.
Uh, and so when I told Kathy, and she thought, wow, what a perfect one for this week. So uh, it was all that uh, transpired a year ago, this, this coming week, um, both for the church and for our family. Uh, so I hopefully I can get through this and, and uh, you'll, you'll uh, understand why I chose it. Would you water my pigs? What do you do? Right? 
you water the pigs. That's just what you do. Small rural community, you help the neighbors out taking care of their animals. So it didn't seem strange to me. I said, sure, Dan, I'll go water your pigs. So he was gone um, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, Monday morning. So Sunday morning before church, I went up to his house, his place, to water the pigs. And they were in a pen in the barn, big pen in the barn. I'm so glad I can say barn here in Maine and nobody thinks I have an accent. <laughs> and I went into the barn and the pigs had moved the watering trough, uh -oh. as pigs do. So I got a five gallon bucket of water and I can't reach the trough because the pigs have moved the trough away from the fence. And I throw one leg over the fence and I got a five gallon bucket on this side of the fence. And the biggest pig in the bunch has a territorial issue with me. <laughs> And she wanders over and puts her teeth right around my left kneecap. And I can feel just a little pressure that she's reminding me where I'm, where I'm at. I'm thinking this is going to be wonderful. <laughs> I'm late for church because Baptist pastor gets kneecap popped off and picked up. <laughs> the local paper is going to have a great time with this one. Pastor bleeds to death and pig pen found <laughs> laying over fence. So I talked nice to the pig, maybe prayed a little bit under my breath. So finally she relented and let go and I was able to get the other leg in the five gallon bucket of water over the fence, watered the pigs. Now I'm late for church. And I gotta get home and take a shower. Because <laughs> now I really smell like pigs. You know, I think about Jesus and his disciples going across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. Here is a herd of pigs on the next shore. A herd so big that it can accommodate a thousand demons. And all I can think of, Jesus must have smelled those pigs long before he got there. What a greeting for a Jewish man to step foot out of the boat in a Gentile land with the smell of pig all around him and there to be met by a frightening man possessed by a legion of demons. And the scripture says this man was so tormented, he wore no clothes. He lived amongst the tombs in the cemetery, I almost said seminary, cemetery. And the local population at times had tried to subdue him. They had chained him, bound him, and he would break free and in a manical way rush off into the wilderness and live out his life tormented by the demons that possessed him. This was what greeted Jesus. A man in sheer spiritual oppression and agony, naked, screaming, yelling, cursing, threatening violence, near a herd of pigs, a man who had lived in the cemetery. In 40 years' experience, I have had experiences of 
walking into a room, getting out of my car in a town, even sitting at a church meeting, and knowing I felt the presence of evil in that room. Anyone else ever have that experience? You've been in a place and you just knew that, wow, something demonic was really close. I have driven into some small communities where I used to work with 150 something churches. I come down out of the hills into these little isolated communities and I could feel the evil when I drove into town. And I would look at the bulletin board at the general store and I would see advertisements for every new age crazy thing under the sun. And we were battling to keep a church open. We war not against flesh and blood. But spiritual evil forces in the highest of places. Jesus gets out of the boat and there's the man. I might have gotten so scared I might have gotten the boat and gone back across the sea. One thing to deal with pigs, it's another with a demon-possessed man. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the demons that have oppressed the man. The word legion says it all of how many are oppressing him. And in this incredible moment when the light of God defeats the power of darkness, Jesus delivers the man from the oppression of the demons. Why the demons recognize who Jesus is and the power of his holy presence in such a way, even the demons beg for mercy. And they look at these unclean animals and say, can you just send us into those pigs? Pigs are no good to you, you're a Jewish man. Pigs are no good to you. Send us into those pigs, that big herd of pigs over there. So Jesus casts out the demons from the man. They go in the pigs, and you know the pigs tumble down the cliff and drown in the Sea of Galilee. And then I believe that we come to the most wonderful part of this account. It says the man is sitting at Jesus' feet. That's the posture of a disciple. That's the position of a disciple. You remember Mary and Martha, and Mary is so concerned about all the work she can't get done, and where does she find Martha? Martha sitting at Jesus' feet. Mary. Mary sitting at... No, I'm sorry. You know who I mean. <laughs> I was given backwards. <laughs> Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. Thank you. I've been in some churches where someone would yell out, you got it wrong, Pastor. <laughs> and, and that would be the correction. But there is the man who just minutes before had been oppressed and tormented all his life, delivered, and his first immediate reaction is to be in a posture of discipleship and submission to Christ. And the scripture says, now he was clothed. And I love this phrase, he was in his right mind. You ever make a bad mistake or do something wrong or, or intentionally do something wrong? And what do we say to ourselves? I did that because I wasn't in my what? I wasn't in my right mind. I mean, I was just telling Mike the other night over supper about how I cut my thumb off on a table saw and had it reattached. I went to the emergency room. I wasn't in my right mind. 
My wife will tell you, I wasn't in my right mind, was I? There's blood all over the place. I got it all wrapped up. My wife hadn't seen it because it was hanging on by a little flap of skin and I straightened it up again and wrapped it in some rags. And uh, I didn't want to show it to Laurie because I wanted to avoid calling an ambulance and I needed to get to the hospital. I wasn't in my right mind. They said, how much pain are you in on a scale of one to 10? I said, oh, a four. <laughs> I'm on a four. I'm holding my thumb on, but I'm only at a number four in pain. <laughs> Things you do. This man is in his right mind. Wow, that says so much. Can you imagine for the first time in that man's life his mind might have been at rest? And at Sabbath? That for the first time in his life his soul and mind were whole? And not in torment, sitting at Jesus' feet? And the kingdom of God is triumphing over the kingdom of evil? And pushing back all that is evil and demonic and vanquishing it and conquering it there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the stench of pigs all around you. Well, something really kind of crazy happens. The people come to see what happens. The people that would take care of the pigs says, Hey, the demon-possessed crazy guy that we can't do anything with, who never wears any clothes and lives in the cemetery, and he's down there sitting at this uh, teacher's feet. The people come. One of the lessons I find in this story, the people had gotten so comfortable with evil, they were afraid of holiness. I don't remember anything else from this sermon this morning. The people had become so comfortable with evil, they were afraid of holiness. They had developed such a comfort zone with what is evil, they could not discern between what is good and what is bad. So they became afraid of Jesus. And what's the end result? They asked Jesus to leave. Yeah, holiness is awesome. The holiness of God should make us feel like Isaiah and say, oh, I'm going to die because what a wretched man I am, but then have to feel the hands of God picking you up. But the people are afraid of Jesus' power and holiness, and they ask him to leave. There's a wonderful story about the Christian musician John Wimber. You ever heard of John Wimber? Yes, sir. And John Wimber tells a story. He was a barroom musician, played saxophone in nightclubs and bars, and became a Christian. Went to a little church in Southern California. Little church said to him, Oh, we're so happy that you came. We've been praying for a revival for a long time. Well, John Wimber started leading his friends in the bar rooms to Christ in the music world. He started bringing them to church. Church elders sat down and had a prayer time and said, we were praying for a revival for a long time, but we weren't praying for this kind of revival. <laughs> Could you take your friends and leave? That's true. True story. So John Wimber took his friends and left and started a whole new Christian movement that became called Vineyard Christian Fellowship. That is the honest to God root of that particular now charismatic denomination. The people look at Jesus and they say, we're more afraid of your holiness than the evil we were living with. 
And they asked Jesus to leave. And then there's the wonderful reaction of the man who had been delivered. I want to go with you. Wouldn't you have wanted to go gone with Jesus after he just totally changed, saved you, delivered you from the most horrid of things, sent the legion of demons into the pigs, wouldn't you want to go with Jesus, be with Jesus forever? And what does Jesus say to that man who's sitting at his feet? He's getting a quick course of discipleship? No, you stay here. You stay here in Decapolis. You stay here in this Gentile world that raises pigs. And you go back and you tell everybody what I have done for you. The man that was demon-possessed, Jesus sends out as a missionary to the province of Decapolis. Wow. The great Christian preacher, teacher, pastor, Tim Keller, says that Jesus looks at all creation and says, Every inch of this is mine. Jesus looks upon all creation and says, Every inch of this is mine. Amen. And if I am truly a disciple follower of Jesus Christ, I want to join in the battle to reclaim it. Because what I see out there in this world is not the reality that God meant. It is false. It is wrong. It is evil. And there is no neutrality. There is simply the cause of Christ. The cause of the world. The city of God. The city of the world the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. I'll close with a story when I saw the holiness of God break through. Um, I got a call early one morning when I was still a local church pastor. It was one of those calls you never want to get. There had been a a double homicide suicide the night before. And it was the police department saying a family would like you to come. Part of the family were members of my church. Um, young man had taken the lives of his mother and father and then took his own life. And this had happened sometime before in the last previous 24 hours and was discovered the previous evening. And this was maybe 4 in the morning when the call came. And he said, Pastor, would you come there? The family wants to see you. So I got to the scene with all the yellow tape. And I'd been to too many of these kind of things because the police recognized me. And they said, uh, we're just cleaning everything up. We're going to close out the crime scene for now. Family is in the kitchen. You can go in, Pastor, and see them. <clears throat> and I remember going under the crime tape, going in and finding the family in the kitchen. Big family, large family, several kids. And all of a sudden, you feel the evil. You just feel the evil. You feel the demonic. And then you see the holiness of God break through. The family looked at me and said, Pastor, in their shock and their trauma. And I feel so inadequate. If left by myself, I cannot do this. 
If I go into myself, I will completely fail everybody in the room. And you only realize that the same power that Jesus showed, like on that beach in Decapolis in, in the garrison, is the only power that's going to take you through something like this. And the family said to me, Pastor, would you go through every room in this house right now and pray with us that the Holy Spirit would drive all the evil away? This house has all the sheetrock punched in. All the family pictures are destroyed and laying in the middle of the living room where the young man had lived out his rage. He said, Pastor, please go with us into every room and pray that Jesus would fill the house now. We walked through that house together that morning and the family said this is the room where we found my mother this is the room we found my father and out here in the attached garage is where we found our brother please pray please pray the evil will leave this place and then they asked me something that just spoke to me about the power, the power, the power of God and Jesus Christ to drive back everything that's evil. The last thing they asked me to pray for was please pray that we can forgive our brother. In the middle of something horrific as this, the presence of Jesus Christ so powerful that traumatized Christian people are saying to me already pray that we can forgive and I am convinced only people who have sat at Jesus' feet could ask that That only knowing Jesus Christ could take you to that place so quickly. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, we're churches. We're outposts in enemy territory. Every square inch of creation is Jesus's. We're going to storm the gates of hell. Because the only time a castle pulls up its drawbridge, it's because it's on the defense, not on the offense. And if I am to storm the gates of hell, it's because the only thing I see in front of me is a cross. Amen. you to stand for our closing hymn number 420 since Jesus came into my
thee, Lord, keep thee. Lord, cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his face upon thee and give thee peace, now and forevermore.